so I'd first like to thank the organisers for giving me the opportunity to share some of my work. I'm currently in the second year of my PhD and what I'm presenting today is very much work in progress. So any suggestions or questions you may have will be greatly appreciated. My talk is entitled, A British Response to the Passions of the Soul. The Arabic to Latin translation movement of the 11th to 13th centuries established the passions of the soul, a long-standing philosophical topic, as part of the European learned medical tradition. As one of the six non-naturals, alongside air, diet, exercise, sleep, and bodily evacuation, the passions were understood to be one of the factors which could influence bodily health in either beneficial or detrimental ways. In The Passions of the Soul, first published in 1649, René Descartes sought to radically transform the standard explanation of how the passions operated across the body and soul. Around a decade later, a group of individuals at the newly founded Royal Society in London began to respond to Descartes' new vision in their own writings. I will argue today that although the leading physicians at the Royal Society rejected Descartes' reformulation of the soul and its passions, following instead the model of his philosophical rival, Pierre Gassendi, they did in fact agree with him in one significant way. In one of the prefatory letters to the passions of the soul, Descartes suggested that the chosen title will perhaps attract a greater number of readers. This was likely to have been the case for an English as well as a French readership, for two textual genres which were flourishing in England at the time had popularized the notion of the passions. These were the health regimen and the vernacular treatise on the passions. So before I discuss Descartes' treatise and how a few Englishmen responded to it, I would first like to sketch out what was generally understood by the term, the passions of the soul, in the first half of the 17th century. The slide you see here shows the title pages of a selection of passion treatises that were published in London between 1601 and 1649. The authors of these texts often came from diverse backgrounds and wrote with different purposes in mind. The Passions of the Mind in general, first published in 1601, was written by the Jesuit priest, Thomas Wright. His treatise approaches the passions from a number of perspectives, touching on their moral, medical, and natural philosophical dimensions. The bulk of the work, however, addresses the passions in the context of rhetoric, a discipline in which the passions had played a crucial role since antiquity. Many passion treatises originally produced in France were translated into English within a few years of their original publication. One of these was The Use of Passions by the Augustinian friar Jean-Francois Senot. This work focused on the moral aspect of the passions and how they could be, be best put to use in order to live a virtuous life. The title page of the English edition from 1649, which you can see in the middle at the bottom of the slide, has an image of reason sitting in her throne controlling the passions while receiving assistance from divine grace, a crucial ingredient for Senot if the passions were to be rightly ordered. Whether they concentrated on the rhetorical or moral nature of the passions, nearly all the treatises offered a brief natural philosophical explanation of how they first arose. The standard definition in the first half of the century, as you can see here, went something like this. The passions are motions of the sensitive appetite caused by the apprehension of good or evil with a change or alteration in the body. The notion that passions arise after an object is deemed to be good or evil is an idea that first appears in ancient Stoicism. For the Stoics, as set out by Cicero in the Tusculan Disputations, there are four fundamental passions. If an object is judged to be a present good, then the soul will feel pleasure. If a present evil, then distress. On the other hand, if something is judged to be a future good, the soul will feel desire. If a future evil, then fear will result. This ancient fourfold classification is displayed by the figures on the title page of the English translation of Nicholas Coefato's treatise, first printed in London in 1621. The idea that passions were motions of the sensitive appetite, the first part of the standard definition, was grounded in the Aristotelian-based faculty psychology that was still taught in the universities throughout Europe at the beginning of the 17th century. According to this model, there were three types of soul, each consisting of a collection of powers or faculties. The sensitive appetite was one of the powers of the sensitive soul, which was present in both animals and humans, though not in plants. 
When an animal or human deemed an object to be beneficial or harmful, the sensitive appetite would stir into motion, producing a variety of passions, such as love, hate, anger, and sorrow, alongside those set out by the Stoics. To understand how the passions of the soul alter the workings of the body, I will turn to a second genre of writing, which was hugely popular in the 17th century, the health regimen. Regimen stressed that it was better to prevent illness developing rather than having to cure it once it had appeared. To do this, they gave advice on how to manage the six non-naturals, one of which was the passions, to ensure that readers optimize their chances of maintaining physical health. One of the most popular regimens in England was Thomas Eliot's the Castle of Health, first published in 1534 and reprinted a further 16 times by the end of the century. In a section dedicated to advice on how to manage the passions, Eliot writes that inordinate passions could cause fevers, trembling pulses, facial deformities, and could even shorten life. Uncontrolled passions, therefore, were as likely to make you sick as they were to make you sin. The standard medical view of how the passions changed bodily physiology is summarized in this table from a medical textbook produced near the end of the 16th century. Joy and anger were thought to inflame the innate heat within the heart and cause the blood and spirits to move towards the periphery of the body. Anger would do this quickly, joy more slowly. Sorrow and fear, on the other hand, dampened the innate heat and caused the blood and spirits to return from the periphery back towards the body center. This account could therefore explain why individuals became pale with fear or turned red with anger. It was against this background that an English translation of Descartes' Passions of the Soul first appeared in London in 1650, just a few months after its initial publication in Paris and in Amsterdam. Breaking with the tradition of the treatises which preceded his own, Descartes stated that his intention was to write of the passions, not as an orator, nor even as a moral philosopher, nor even as a moral philosopher would, but simply en physicien, a term which in 1650 was translated as a physician, but which has been most recently rendered as a natural philosopher. Rather than seeing the passions as motions of the soul sensitive appetite, he states in the 27th article of his treatise that the passions can be defined in general as perceptions or sensations or emotions of the soul that we refer particularly to the soul itself and that are caused, sustained, and fortified by some movements of the spirits. That the passions are now caused by movements of the physical spirits and not by value judgment made by the soul radically alters the understanding of how the passions originate and how they function across body and soul. It is the British response to the new natural philosophy of the passions originating on the continent, which I will now turn. Henry Moore, is now often remembered as one of the members of the philosophical circle known as the Cambridge Platonists. But he was also elected a fellow of the Royal Society in 1664 at the age of 50. Soon after this, in 1667, he published a moral philosophical treatise in Latin entitled Enchiridium Ethicum, which later came out in, the English, in English under the title An Account of Virtue. This work featured an extended analysis of the passions, which according to tradition, must be controlled by reason if virtue is to be attained. He begins by stating that no man has, in my opinion, more accurately summed up or distinctly defined the several kinds of species of passions than the renowned philosopher Descartes. I will tread for the most part in his footsteps. He then presents his definition of a passion and echoing Descartes, he further states that a passion is a vehement sensation of the soul, which refers especially to the soul itself and is accompanied with an unwanted motion of the spirits. Moore also adopted and modified the Cartesian taxonomy of the passions. Whilst Descartes listed six fundamental passions, which were admiration, sometimes translated as wonder, love, hatred, desire, joy, and sorrow, Moore condensed this to three, keeping admiration first and contracting the others into forms of love and hatred. Like Descartes, he saw admiration, the first passion of all, as seated in the brain. For both authors, admiration's role was to register the novelty of an object and keep an individual attentively engaged in contemplating it. Only when an object was deemed to be good or bad for a subject did the passions of love and hatred arise, with more maintaining that it was the heart, not the head, 
which was the seat of these latter two passions. Descott, meanwhile, in a section of his treatise entitled that the seat of the passions is not in the heart, insisted that love, hatred, and many of the other passions were merely felt in the heart, and this was only through the agency of a little nerve that descended to it from the brain. An observation he possibly drew from his own anatomical investigations. Moore, meanwhile, hesitated in giving such concrete explanations, making it clear that his work concerned moral rather than natural philosophy. Another fellow of the Royal Society who wrote about the passions just a few years later would not hold back on natural philosophical explanations. This was Thomas Willis, the Sedleyan Professor of Natural Philosophy at the University of Oxford, and his account of the passions markedly differed from those given by Moore and Descartes. In 1664, Willis published his groundbreaking Cerebre Anatome, which described and pictured the brain and nervous system in unprecedented detail. And it is chiefly this work which has earned him the title, The Father of Neurology. Eight years later, he published De Anima Brutorum, later translated into English as Two Discourses Concerning the Soul of Brutes. It is in this text, which, he builds, up, which builds upon his previous neuroanatomical findings, that Willis most fully expressed his theory of the soul and its passions. He begins by recounting some of the opinions of, on the soul proposed by both ancient and modern thinkers. One of the moderns singled out for praise is Descartes, who Willis calls the most illustrious Cartesius. Ultimately, however, it was the psychological theory of Pierre Gassendi which Willis favoured. For Gassendi, and following him, for Willis, humans had two souls. The first type was the corporeal soul, which was made of subtle particles, sometimes referred to as atoms, a term taken from ancient Epicureans, from the ancient Epicureans. It was this corporeal soul which gave Willis's work its title. It was the anima brutorum, the soul shared by both animals and humans. This soul had two parts, the vital and the sensitive. According to the theory, the vital powers of the corporeal soul were contained in fiery particles found in the blood, and they were responsible for animating the body, giving it life. The sensitive powers were provided by the animal spirits, which flowed through the brain and nervous system, and they were responsible for sensation and the production of the passions. Alongside the corporeal soul, humans also possessed a purely immaterial and immortal rational soul, enabling Gassendi's Epicurean-based natural philosophy to be portrayed as compatible with Christianity, an essential point not only for Gassendi, a Catholic priest, but for all God-fearing philosophers. Willis, in a chapter entitled Of the Passions or Affections of the Corporeal Soul in General, adopted the traditional view that the passions were motions of the sensitive appetite caused by the apprehension of some good or evil. This view, however, operated within the new psychophysiological framework established by Gassendi, who held that the sensitive soul and the animal spirits housed within the brain and nerves were essentially one and the same. So once an object was deemed to be good or bad, animal spirits would move in the brain and then travel down to the heart where they would be most keenly felt. In keeping with Descartes and accordance with his own investigations, Willis also suggested that the passions reach the heart only through the nerves which travel to it from the brain. This neuroanatomical explanation of heartfelt passions is not one I have seen in regimens or passion treatises preceding Descartes, and it is an idea taken up by at least one other English physician of the period. As president of the Royal College of Physicians between 1689 and 1691, and prior to that, to personal doctor to both Charles I and II. Walter Charlton was one of the most decorated doctors in England during the second half of the 17th century. In 1674, as a fellow of the Royal Society, he published A Natural History of the Passions. Following in the footsteps of Descartes, and as the title of the work indicates, Charlton's aim was to provide a natural philosophical account of the passions. Recycling without acknowledgement, a line from Descartes' own preface, he writes in his introductory epistle to the reader, my design was to write of this argument, neither as an orator, nor as a moral philosopher, but only as a natural one, conversant in pathology. Later in the introduction, he does give credit to Descartes and tells the reader that, his own, that in his own work, he has interwoven threads taken from three excellent men, Gassendi, Descartes, and Thomas Hobbes. His largest debt, however, is reserved for Thomas Willis, and he states, 
the greatest part of what is delivered hath been borrowed from that elaborate work of our learned Dr. Willis, De Anima Brutorum. Charlton explicitly supported the theory that humans had two souls, one corporeal, the other rational. And throughout the treatise, there are references back to Willis and Gassendi. At one point, he explicitly criticizes Descartes, stating, had this excellent man, Monsieur Descartes, been but half as conversant in anatomy as he seems to have been in geometry, doubtless he would never have lodged so, so noble a guest as the rational soul in so incommodious a closet of the brain as the glandular pinealis. In a later section of the treatise, however, Charlton pondered how the spirits in the brain could reach the heart so quickly. And in line with Descartes, he too concluded that the passions were transmitted to the heart through the nerves that descended to it from the brain. So despite Charlton's dismissal of Descartes' anatomical knowledge, he, like Willis, agreed that it was only through the nerves connecting the brain and heart that the passions could affect the heart and principally from, principally from there, the entire body. In The Passions of the Soul, Descartes attempted to redefine the natural philosophy which underpinned one of the major concepts in the European learned medical tradition. He was, not, he was not, however, alone in his attempt to modernize this notion, which had its roots in Greek antiquity. Although it was Pierre Gassendi's science of the soul and its passions, which Willis and Charlton adopted and championed, their view of how the passions communicate between the brain and the heart aligned with the neuroanatomical explanation previously given by Descartes. The next phase of my own research will be to find out whether these views were shared by the medical and scientific community at large in England, and to note how this tied into the wider ethical and religious discourse on the passions in the second half of the 17th century.